with telling us um, how and why she made the brave decision to make her life an art. Yeah. And I was saying, like, I don't think it was really a decision. It was like, if anything, it was like a series of non-decisions because I refused to make decisions. And so therefore, the only thing that I could do was art, <laughs> basically, is what happened. Um, but yeah, for the people online, like, I had a very supportive family who were always just very kind of convinced that it was fine and it would all kind of come out in the wash, basically. So that's sort of what happened. And then, yeah, I went to university. And again, just kept on going. I mean, I've never really made any money from my actual artwork, but I'm very good at finding way, finding finding employment. Um, so I've done a lot of different jobs, like pop making and casting, and um, lots of teaching and kind of tech work and picture framer for a while. And worked at a magazine. I was a marketing editor, which didn't. <laughs> um, so it's just sort of finding all of these other routes which sort of allow me to have a very expensive hobby as an artist. But now it's sort of, I kind of was saying to someone the other day, I feel like I've kind of been spat out of the pandemic suddenly with a career that I didn't really <laughs> realise I had. But, yeah. yeah, so the podcast and like the PhD, like so I'm doing a PhD at Newcastle University and did this fellowship before that also at Newcastle. So it's sort of having spent like whatever it's been three and a half years basically two years like hold up at home and it's suddenly coming out of the other side of it i can sort of see a way forward in a way that i didn't previously um i think probably kind of being attached to academia in the uk it sort of has given me a sort of a, a base level of stability and a kind of an understanding of I'm much clearer about what my practice is and like what I want to achieve with it and all of that kind of thing. But it's yeah, it's interesting kind of yeah, basically I've spent the entire time like on Zoom and at home and now kind of coming out and talking to people, including like my students and they're sort of I'm saying like, Oh, maybe I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's a nice feeling. Yeah, it's good. Um, but I'm gonna ask a little bit more because you know, a lot of people do say, Oh, I don't think I can do anything else or and yes, I've got a supportive family. So one of the things you said was you had people in your family who were artists who knew what the um, Yeah. But there's also, you know, there's there's more to that. Um, what kind of art were you making as a child? Were you like sort of doing it at home? Was it a way to escape? Was it, um, you know, what? It sounds a little bit like right now is the moment that you're like, oh, I can't make a job out of this. But that's yeah. not really true either. Because <laughs> for a long time, so yeah. I'll, I'll just ask you to dig a little. Yeah, so again, it was just we just had a very, very makey family. Like, so, and it was, I mean, so I think you sort of said something about like intergenerational relationships. Like, that's that's something that I've kind of again been reflecting on a lot in the last maybe three or four years. But so, my one of my grandmothers moved to Cardiff, where I'm from, from like the middle of nowhere the countryside when I was maybe like 10, 12, something like that. And she was a very, very difficult woman. And as part of the kind of transition, she moved on her own and as part of the transition, my parents were like, Eva, you like making things. She used to be like a phone economics teacher. She's, I mean, she was an incredible craftsperson. You'll go and spend Friday nights after school with her and you can have a project and that'll just, you'll learn something and it'll keep her company. And I carried on doing that for years, like until I think I, you know, discovered drugs and alcohol was 15 or something and decided it was too, <laughs> I didn't want to do it anymore. But like, you kind of fall into it, like I was sort of, I, I had this relationship with her, which was through making, and it was amazing. Like, I mean, again, very difficult woman, she never put the heating on, all of these issues with her, but we had this relationship through making where I was, yeah, I learned how to sew, I learned how to make marmalade, like we did gardening, like we knitted, like we did all of these sort of crafty things. And all of that is now really integral to what I'm doing now. Um, and then again, like one of my other, like great aunt on the other side was one of was the artists and she had a, a studio in London which was attached to her house. And we used to, again, go down 
and like hang out with her and she'd just be in in the in the studio and I'd sort of like come in and she'd hand me some clay and she used to like throw it on the floor to kind of shape it and then put it together and then cast it and things so I was I was introduced to a lot of quite complicated sort of art like traditional art processes and craft processes really early on um and then was just like making salt dough and doing bits of woodwork in my dad's shed and stuff like that mm -hmm. it's just sort of one of those things that was always something that I did which is lucky yeah no really really lucky and increasingly rare yeah absolutely and again I think that's the that's one of the things that sort of drives like the podcast and again like kind of what what I'm doing now and it, because because it was such a formative thing that I keep on coming back to but I had so many relationships with people through making that I would never have had if the making wasn't the thing that we that brought us together um and even like friendships now like most of them are through clay in some capacity like um so it's I think it's incredibly important and like I know that I had an I had this unbelievably privileged back uh, you know upbringing in order to be have access to all of that but that I think is kind of the driving force behind a lot of what I'm doing now because I just think everybody needs to be needs to have the choice to have that option if they want it and just knowing that it's possible to make things that's part of that choice is that you need to know that there is such a thing as yeah making your own marmalade well yeah and like you know, we were saying at lunch, like I've spent most of the pandemic remodeling my house and I know that it's possible to tile a bathroom and paint a wall and put in, I don't know, a kitchen because I watched my dad do it. And I, at points, probably handed him a spanner or something, you know, it's sort of, but you, and like, you know, I started knitting, but I know that knitting is possible because I grew up with people just like, you know, knitting with their hands going at like you know 20 miles an hour whilst watching tv and having a conversation and probably cooking at the same time you know it was that that kind of like casual skill level was just something that was always around in my house and it's so it's so now when I kind of get faced with something that I don't know how to do I kind of just assume that probably incredibly arrogantly that I'll be able to at least do some of it figure it out yeah, yeah. with the help yeah. of YouTube <laughs> <laughs> which is quite a quite a thing the make do attitude yeah um, and of course I can't help but connect everything you're saying as well to the, the clay studio and just kids who get Playmobil in their school have see somebody making something they get to make something they might have a bowl that they can take home and yeah. use and there are many people in the world who don't, again, don't know that this is a thing that you can make and then actually use it. Um, and that's really empowering, yeah. being able to create something that is um, for use. I, and I also can't help but thinking that you said twice that your grandmother was quite a difficult woman. Yeah. <laughs> but she had the patience to oh, sit yeah. with a child and help you figure out these different projects. And that takes a lot that takes patience too so yeah, yeah she had to save up all the <laughs> yeah she all her patience on me <laughs> yeah. possibly that's, that's not quite what I meant but <laughs> she had those skills she just applied them only oh, when yeah. she wanted to oh no she was an incredible teacher like there was no doubt about that it was just sort of yeah familial relationships are never easy are they so yeah they're not no. but but it worked out to your benefit because it's you know, they wanted someone oh, yeah. to spend time with them. So yeah, definitely. They sent you over there. Um, now I'm just like terrified and checking all the chats in case they are telling me that I'm still on mute. No, we're good. Okay. Um, so this brings us to the reason that you're here mm. and your project, your research that you're doing, um, which I don't know if it grew out of Clay Commons or Clay Commons is sort of a is it separate? Is it a, um, you know, an aspect of it? So for, for those who don't know, Clay Com Commons is a really wonderful podcast that Eva does. And you could explain maybe first what the concept behind the podcast is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
the podcast. So the podcast is about, so in the UK, there's been this decline in formal education in ceramics and material uh, specific education. So it's kind of been, you know, we went through it from a position maybe in the 80s where every single school would have had a kiln and there were, I don't know, something like 60 BA university courses that you could go to. And we now have maybe two material specific um, BA courses like university courses that you can go to so it's been completely ripped out of the education like the formal education system but what was what I started noticing when I did my master's program which I think I graduated in 2016 um, was that as all of this sort of decline was happening there was also a resurgence of loads and loads of different disciplines using clay so there were loads of fine artists that were using it. It was like in every single gallery and art fair that I was going to. There was lots of product designers that like even like big architects seemed to be using brick again. It was this sort of big thing, which was I kind of just noticed. And then sort of from that, I've kind of become, that was, I suppose, the starting point of this. And then it's sort of the, the podcast. So I kind of had this idea at some point between then and, when the podcast started of trying to kind of map where people were were making with clay like I kind of kept up kept on coming across people who were like oh yeah I've got an open studio like I've got this studio and this one's popped up and oh I went to an evening class and all this kind of thing and nobody seemed to be paying any attention to what what was happening in each of them why they were set up like just anything about them really so that's what I started off with like just sort of emailing people and being like would you talk to me about your studio basically and then from that it kind of snowballed and turned into this podcast and a PhD where I'm kind of looking at clay where people are making clay and learning clay so uh, places like the, the clay studio basically um, but in the UK it's obviously it's a really new thing so whereas in America you seem to have a very quite a long history of kind of independent craft schools and um, certainly open studios and kind of shared resources and sort of community um, art programs and things it really doesn't happen in the UK it's not not in the same in the same way um, so yeah I've sort of started mapping that and looking at that and trying to just get a better handle on what what that is but then I've kind of got really I got really overexcited because I kept on finding these people who were doing incredible things and it kind of went away from education and I found people who were you know in New York who were teaching undocumented migrants their like human rights through clay making and people who are working with um people with dementia um in the UK and like people who are literally kind of giving identity and agency or like building building that back up with communities like through making with clay so that's kind of what the podcast is about basically I just talked to an awful lot of really interesting amazing <laughs> projects um about the good work that they're doing with clay well yeah it's 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 a great um, resource too for finding those yeah. people because sometimes as a curator and you know thinking about what we want to show in the gallery and think about and what programs we want to do and model other programs it it's actually finding them sometimes that's the problem and you know it's yeah. one thing to read the newspaper and the art newspaper and but it's I think it's really important to have these places that are. Um, aggregating the information well, this the is, resource for people yeah and I guess this is the the sort of gap that I hope the research can fill I suppose because you know again from a UK perspective you used to have universities where you know you're pretty you can find a network through that basically and they used to be these kind of like central hubs and we've got like a craft council and an arts council but they don't really act as like a kind of a base for people they're just these sort of floating entities that sometimes give people money but I think and that's the thing that I was finding that I kind of kept on meeting all of these amazing artists and studios and workshops and things like that 
and they didn't know each other or they'd heard about each other, but they'd never spoken to each other. Um, and they're so busy doing the amazing work that they're doing that they don't have time to kind of look out and have a kind of professional support system. So, which, I, and then that also means that you have people who are just reinventing the wheel the entire time because you have, yeah, you have recent graduates or whatever who are like, oh, I want to set up a play studio and they just go out and they do everything wrong and, you know, they kind of make it really difficult for themselves. So it's sort of trying to find that way of, what I'm hoping is that it can eventually turn into a kind of, some kind of central core where all of this stuff can kind of revolve around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and that's, a, it's a really important service that, I mean, we could have another hour long conversation about the organizations that are sort of set up to do this, but then, then the American Craft Council is, um, you know, founded in 1947. Calendra 46, um, I might have the exact year wrong, but it was, you know, really began as this robust resource for people to become members, to help each other. And over the years, it's really changed so much. And right now it's not serving that purpose in, in one way it is. And there are sort of shows that they do and they gather people to sell, but they're really not fulfilling that kind of more academic thought based yeah. work that they have in the past been really good at. So it's, I mean, kudos, <laughs> it's needed and we appreciate it. Um, I want to show people some and have you talk through a few of images of your own work and mm -hmm. then we have a lot more to talk about, but one thing is to hear um, how, your, how your week has been so far in Philadelphia. <laughs> All right, everyone, bear with me for a moment. to click on the buttons. There you go. Okay, so um, Eva put a few slides together so we could all get a look at her work that you guys don't get to see. Why did this <laughs> not happen last week? I think I'll do this we were upstairs. We have stairs, but we, oh, we did it down here. Oh, we were with Molly and we were talking about our own work. See everyone, my, my cylinders are not all firing. We're gonna turn around. No, it's fine. I'm just gonna do it like this. We're gonna do this. We're movable. Look at that. I mean, it won't be big, but you can see it, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me get out of it. You can, you can advance your slides. There we go. Sure. Um, let me just talk about the work. Yeah, just yeah. do like, you know, a, a quick, quick little, thing. What are, what are we seeing? This is a gallery installation that looks yeah. like a production studio. Yeah, so I graduated RCA and uh, the Royal College of Art. Um, and I'd sort of start, that was when I kind of started thinking about that kind of like intergenerational thing. And I'd lots of, you know, all the people that I've mentioned, like my kind of great grand, my great aunt and um, my grandparents and stuff kind of all passed away within a quite a short period of time. And um, I inherited loads of stuff from them. <laughs> Lots of like equipment, like especially from my great aunt, she had this amazing sink, um, like big plastic kind of mint green sink and like lots of weird plastic jugs and stuff. Like really just like lots of random stuff. Um, so I kind of started making them, like kind of replicating them, I guess. Um, I suppose as a way of trying to get closer to her, I suppose, or to try and kind of remember her or sort of some, something about that anyway. So I sort of started remaking these things. And then I got um, a commission to do this project at the British Ceramics Biennial in Stoke-on-Trent, which is the kind of old industrial town um ceramics town in um in the uk and we were exhibiting in one of their old abandoned factories mm -hmm. so i was able to kind of go in there and i basically just pushed this idea further and found all of these amazing i mean some of these things look like they're massive like i mean this is massive that's well big it's like that kind of size um but actually there were jugs 
that were like this big because it was for slip like kind of industrial slip casting so a lot of this stuff that I was finding was kind of they had it, it looked really random but you know you had these like really amazing kind of weird plastic handles and like because they're all made out of plastic everything's like very thin so I just kind of replicated a load of them and then sort of uh decided uh, were they in a mold no they're all hand built yeah Did you think? yeah coiled yeah so I coil build I don't throw um so all of so this one in the center is maybe this kind of size so that's slabbed this side this one and then all of these other ones are all coil built so yeah I do coil building and slab building and casting mainly What's the very big thing in the right side? This? Yes. So again, it was just one of those sort of industrial forms that I found. So I'd sort of installed it at the BCB in this sort of old um, uh, studio, oh, this old sort of factory in one way. And then I got um, an opportunity to go to South Korea um, and exhibit at Clay Arch in Gimhae, which is quite a big um, place. So this was part, this is what, this is why it looks so fancy, because it was in this like amazing building. Um, so I kind of reimagined it um, using the packing crates and some of the sort of stuff that I'd found around. They have, it's a gallery, but it's also a residency program. So they have, I like kind of gathered a bunch of stuff from, from the area and kind of put it together. So again, it was this sort of idea of, I suppose, trying to like layer the community as I was going. So it was sort of, some of the stuff was replicated from my great aunt space. Some of it was kind of connecting to the community in Stoke-on-Trent and the kind of the industry there. And then this was also then sort of layering on top of the kind of South Korea and the community I met there and the people that had helped me move it across. So that was kind of where I landed. And then, yeah, then I got this. It 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 feel it's gonna feel like it shifts loads, but it doesn't. There was quite a lot of time between this and this piece, which is the kind of series of work that I was doing when I was at Newcastle at, or as I'm at Newcastle as part of the Norma Lippmann Fellowship. And although it it feels very different, I mean, obviously it's like glazed and things like that. So there's sort of aesthetic differences, but actually the the underlying idea of it is still exactly the same. I mean, this is a, a chair. So when I was talking about my um, difficult grandmother, this is the chair that we used to sew with. So it would we'd be on the floor and we'd use it as a pin cushion. So or I would use it as a pin cushion and she would tell me off for doing that. But anyway, so this is what um, so I kind of, again, inherited this thing and just decided to make it. Um, so I kind of started making all of these things. I think as well, like once I'd got to Newcastle, I did a whole load of stuff. There was like the BCB show. Um, I also co-run a, um, like a kind of socially engaged collective and we built a project space, which I don't have a photo of here, but, and we did lots of big group shows and I was kind of exhibiting in lots of other things. And like, there was lots of other bits and pieces, but if we're kind of doing the kind of key points, it was that Korean show. And then I got off the back of that, I got this fellowship at Newcastle. And again, it's one of those things, like I feel like I've spent a lot of my time chasing kilns as I've, as I've been an artist, because <laughs> I don't have a studio, I don't, have, I've always had a studio, but I've never had a studio with a kiln. So I've always tried to like chase residencies, which have given me opportunities to do things. And once I got to Newcastle, they have a very large, they don't have a ceramic department, but they have a very large workshop within, um, uh, within their, <laughs> um, within, yeah, they've got a very large, uh, ceramic studio within their wider fine art department. So, so it, it kind of opened up these sort of possibilities. And then also like the fellowship gave me stability in a way that I'd never had before. So I had, you know, a, a salary. So I just was like, well, I kind of feel like making a chair. So I'm going to make a chair. So I made this chair, um, which I think there's just, um, and it kind of, it, there was also, 
if you could look on my Instagram account, actually, you can see how it was made. So it's it's to scale. And I made an armature first, then I packed clay over it and modeled it. Then I took a plaster mold of it. Then I press molded it. Then I fired it. Then I glazed it. And there's some other sort of plaster turning work that happened for the, for the legs and stuff as well. Um, and I actually kind of recreated a couple of other objects as well from that, from that living room where I was sort of thinking about this sort of idea of intergenerational learning and relationships and stuff, which was embodied through objects. So that was kind of where that started, like this sort of idea of how it kind of links, how all of these objects sort of link together. Um, and then, yeah, for the sort of final show, it was exhibited. I'd also done all of this sort of staging. So it was kind of re-exhibited in this sort of construction that I made, um, which you look through these little holes in the, in the walls, in the door, and then kind of saw it as this sort of drawing kind of um, theater scape. So I'd kind of been, I hope if I zip through. So this was the other thing that I'd been doing so I'd been working with, I think theatre is something that sort of informed me quite a lot anyway. Um, but again, I'd sort of been quite, and there's another family link there as well, but I'd been interested in theatre and staging and kind of organ, like even with the, the sort of Korean one, a Korea show, Korean show, it was that idea of staging something that kind of felt like I was sort of starting to think about the stage as a, a kind of potential space where it was sort of activated by people and like the objects were kind of, they had this sort of potential and this kind of charge, I suppose, which only were activated once you kind of, once people walked into it. Um, and again, working at Newcastle University, I was able to jump onto an opera <laughs> that happened. So I made the set for that, which is this, and it was, presented in this amazing Baroque uh, National Trust place in the UK, uh, around the corner from us. So, so that was all of that kind of staging stuff that was happening concurrently. And that was sort of what I suppose was informing this kind of staging um, with the kind of theater flats and stuff that was sort of happening at that point. Um, I also made these sort of houses. So again, these are kind of replicas of the houses that either I grew up in or that my grandparents were in. So that again, trying to just constantly find ways of getting back to or kind of remembering or honoring somehow those sort of relationships and the, the spaces that I was doing that in, like it kind of, and how like objects can take the place of people sometimes or kind of stand in place with them or kind of be a placeholder for them or something. But it's, so this is the thing that's sort of interesting because all of these things feel very different to the kind of socially engaged stuff and the, the clay commons and the podcasts and stuff. But actually it's all about, I had this like epiphany a couple of months ago and I was like, oh my God, it's the same thing. It's all about the same thing, which is basically space and relationships within that space. So, you know, whilst I'm here, I'm using my dad's analog camera, which I've, you know, he's still alive, but he's gifted it to me. So I'm kind of going around using these, like repurposing and reusing and kind of using these objects as a way of creating new narratives and kind of passing on those relationships. And yeah, just holding that space or investigating the space in which these, in which making happens, but also in which making facilitates relationships. Mm. Which it really, it does. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Sorry, I ramble too much. I think that's the end of them. Oh, and then clay commons. When they glazed, um, you made of dark clay, and um, they glazed or? Yeah, they were made out of terracotta and then um, glazed just with a black mat. I don't, I mean, you can probably tell, I don't, <laughs> when I went to, um, I had my, um, my interview for my master's program and, um, one of the questions they they asked, they were like, so you don't seem to glaze anything. Is that a uh, conceptual reason or is that just because you can't do it? I was like, <laughs> kind of both, but I'm willing to learn. <laughs> so, but yeah, I because I come from a, a fine art background, like rather than, I, I've never been trained in ceramics. I just 
fell into clay fairly early on and just never left it. So I kind of just keep on going. And every time I make something with clay, something seems to work. So I just keep, I just like, you know, it's like following that kind of sugar rush or something where it's like, oh, this works. So I'll just keep on doing it. Um, so yeah, so because I've never been taught, I've never really done much like glazing or anything. Like we did a bit at master's program, but there wasn't really anything. So I just, I yeah, I don't pay much attention to glazing is basically what I'm trying to say. I just use uh, shop bought stuff when I need to. Just wondered if it was matte or not. Oh yeah, the, well, it's a matte glaze, yeah. Um, and yeah, they got installed in a couple of different places as well. So they kind of were installed in, yeah, the studio gallery space at Newcastle. And then you saw them in like a forest space, which was quite nice as well in a sculpture park. And this seems like the most simple question and the most you know, complicated question. And that is that you're doing all this research based on making and intergenerational relationships. And mm -hmm. what you said was so beautiful about space where we make things is also the space where we're making relationships. Can you talk a little bit about why you think play is particularly um, good at that? Generous in this in this process. Yeah. Um so from the conversations that I have had, there's a couple of things that seem to keep on that people keep on coming back to and repeating with clay. And I think when we're talking about community building one of the things like in these sort of more formal spaces the thing that happens is that because they have to be these like bricks and mortar permanent ish spaces it means that especially for vulnerable communities they can kind of come back they keep on coming back and there's a space where they can have a sense of ownership there's a commonality of purpose so you're kind of all around the table doing the same or something similar. Um, and then you all have to, there's a duty of care as well if you're using a communal space, like you can't leave things around, like you have, you can't like mix red and white clay together, like you have to be careful and you have to clean up after yourself, which again engenders this idea of, of ownership within spaces, which I think is is really important, like especially for people who live precariously like having somewhere that they can come and it's a safe space they know who's going to be there they know when they can come like there's a there's a level of stability which a lot of the people that I've been speaking to like the communities they work with they don't have that so it becomes this incredibly kind of centralizing thing and that's you know talking about vulnerable communities but it's exactly the same for anybody really like you can come and you know that you have friends and people that you know that you that are here and you know where everything is and it's it's a comfortable space to be. Um, the other thing that I think keeps on coming up is something to do with the kind of time-based nature of clay, I suppose. So the fact that it's this, it's both really immediate, but also really long. So you can press on it and you can instantly see yourself mirrored back. So especially for people who are in crisis or something like that, a lot of like kind of detachment happens from, from your body. So being able to kind of physically, like literally ground yourself in the thing that you're making is incredibly powerful. And similarly with sort of dementia, if you're working with people with dementia, like that it kind of holds people in time. Like, so you kind of, as a, what happens with dementia is that you kind of slip in and out of time or like a lot. Whereas if you're working with clay, you can, you start at A and you get to B and you can sort of see that progress. And also you can see the person next to you doing the same thing. So you're both in time at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. So there's all of these sort of things that kind of, and also it's just really fun. Like, I think it, like people just, I mean, as long as you don't mind getting dirty, like I think it's one of those things that it's, I don't know, not to sound too hippie about it, but it is the oldest material that people have been using. So it's, there's a, there's a, I think a kind of primordial memory that we have with it. And it's also just around us all the time as well. So, you know, it's the cup that we have our coffee from and all of these things. So all of that kind of comes together, which means that it just works.
And I think you get, you know, I mean, we were having this really lovely kind of craft morning with um, Helen and everyone, weren't we? Like, I think craft and making in general does that mm -hmm. more broadly. Um, you know, there's lots of neuroscience about what happens when people are creative or using their hands and things like that. So it could be translated into everything, anything, um, you know, like knitting or needlework or even kind of drawing and painting. But with clay, you don't even need tools. Like it's about, there's, the, there's nothing kind of mediated. So it's just you and the, I mean, you can use tools, but it's just you and the clay. So, you know, apart from anything, it's stop, it means that, you know, if you don't have hands or something, then you don't feel left out, like you can still do something with it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's all sorts of stuff around that, I think. I don't think I never thought about that idea of it being time based and in terms of, you know, dementia patients sort of being able to, you know, if you're forgetting mm. your sort of short term memory or something, you just look at the thing you're doing and you yeah. hear back. That's hot. And also, I think, I think one of the first things that fit, one of the first things that goes in dementia is it's like one side of your brain, which is attached to language, but clay doesn't need language. So you can still, like, there's a lot of like, underlying muscle memory and kind of knowledge that your body holds that you can then express through play without having to to think about it mm -hmm. or like explain like explain it i think also about to emphasize the same things you're talking about when um you know bringing a clay program to the kids who are in the juvenile justice center and yeah. there's nothing in their life that they can control but they can control yeah. what the clay is doing and it's pretty as you're saying, it's malleable. It's pretty easy to see that you've done that and to make yeah. make a change and have it be physical. Yes, yeah. it also can be powerful. It's really powerful, and it also teaches you resilience. Like you have to give up control, <laughs> and a lot of stuff is going to break, and you have to open up the kiln. You have to deal with that. So you know you can the amount of times I like made something and came back the next day, and it was just this like you know puddle on the floor or whatever like the whole thing it just collapsed in on itself when I was first sort of starting off so it's like you have to you learn to to deal with that and again that's the thing it's a it's really really valuable lessons like I mean there's an artist in um, the UK called Jack Tan who's been doing taking this sort of metaphor of transformation which happens through materials and through making and like clay is a prime example of something that transforms and using it as a way of teaching and working with policymakers in arts organizations mm. and sort of using it as a metaphor for training. So it's like, as someone is trained, they go through these different periods of flux where they're going to be a little bit more fragile because they're kind of transitioning from one thing into another. And you can see that very clearly when you're working with clay, you're like, okay, well, this is the point where you you kind of understand what's happening, but you're, you haven't quite, it hasn't quite solidified. Okay, now you're okay. Now you're safe. Now you're fine. So it's like, it seems like a very kind of esoteric sort of easy concept, I suppose, like some like obvious concept, but I think it's really deep. I mean, I hope it is because I've got to write a PhD on it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of metaphorical there meat in there for yeah you to, for you to work with for sure and that actually although I'm selfishly want to hear you talk about Philadelphia um <laughs> I've I'm reminded of when we met and I heard you talk about that project that you were doing with Mary and, and the others so maybe you could just um give an overview of that work that you did the, the tape practice project, yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah so i don't really feel like although it you know it's obviously me on my own and I'm doing the PhD but the majority of my thinking kind of comes through relationships with other people so one of the big things that happened when I went to the RCA was that I met um, Mary O'Malley and this other artist Katie Sprague um, and we spent a huge amount of time arguing about like kind of pedagogical things to do with craft and like kind of value of skill and things so Mary O'Malley's um, an American artist she came up through a very kind of traditional craft school I came through a fine art school so I was like skill who, who cares about that and then <laughs> and, um, and Katie was kind of like has always been our kind of mediator between the two of us um, 
but we kind of started talking about all of this and like all the things I was talking about, the sort of decline in HE and things. Like it was something that we were all noticing happening. So we ended up getting together and um, forming this collective called Collective Matter. And basically we formed in order to apply for this project at the Tate Modern, which we didn't really think we were gonna get. And then we got, and so we ended up doing this sort of six month project across four different galleries, well, three different galleries and the Tate Modern. We engaged something like 500 people. Um, there were like two councils involved. It was massive. <laughs> and we kind of went and did all of these different workshops with people, um, with clay workshops. And it was like, and then ended up in this big uh, sort of final exhibition sort of workshop situation at, um, at the Tate. And there were lots of things wrong with that project. Like it was sort of around, it was being funded by a massive um, corporation that was sort of gentrifying um, an area of London and the whole, you know, they we were being kind of used as that sort of art washing type thing. Um, which, so I think if we were doing it again, we probably wouldn't wouldn't have done it, quite frankly, but we learned loads and yeah, it was a really amazing experience to kind of go through, like a growth experience for us. And then after that, we've kind of carried on working together. So now we have um, a studio in London where we run a, a, a ceramics residency out of, um, which is sort of offering six months for artists or people who have a project in clay or people who want to develop something in clay. Um, we have a project space, which we designed and um, built in um, a sculpture park just outside of London, which again, we've done various like kind of programming for that as well. Um, we've done lots of talks, things like that. But I think kind of as we, after the Tate project, basically, we did a couple of, we did a couple, excuse me, a couple more um, kind of front facing social engagement projects and basically realize that there are other people who are doing that better. And what we were good at was trying to organize the sort of back end of, of that. So we've kind of moved, shifted more into trying to create opportunities for people to have like kind of professional level experiences. So like these sort of programs, we're currently trying to put together a program for like a two year peer led learning. Um, program which would be based at our project space so it's sort of trying to find I think what we do quite well is bring people together and create opportunities for them to work together so that's sort of where where that work like where that falls so I'll just say you're basically you're really hiding your light under a basket <laughs> <laughs> you know you just talked about yourself and your PhD project and then you have this entire even in your bio that you said <laughs> it has nothing about this like massive other yeah. thing that you do yeah which is very important <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the foundation of everything that kind of has come out of it, really. I mean, it was, you know, I've always done teaching, I've always done workshops, I've always sort of been interested in that side of things, but actually kind of collective matter was the first time that I started feeling, you know, like this sort of idea of a career, right? Or like you kind of find your feet or like you find the thing that you're interested in. And this was the first time that that kind of started to materialize, really. Um, so yeah, I owe loads to Mary and Katie. I'm very glad they still agree to work with me. I got a bit um, a, a dictatory about our email thread at one point. <laughs> well, I'm grateful to them as well and to you because we're sitting in Making Place Matter, which for which Collective Matter was one of my models, our Aww. models. I mean, I went to York and did one of those workshops because you yeah. did kind of a model one there and then came back and said, I just came back and there are these great <laughs> ladies who are doing this work in England and I want to do something like that. So Thanks. that's really nice. We figured out how to, I mean, and it, it's one of the reasons it clicked for us was because it is bringing the gallery and the, our amazing education colleagues, you know, together and making, making work and thinking about um, things and then having it turn into something that could be in the gallery and, we yeah. had a council and we did our workshops that were, yeah. you know, thinking about the way that you had, had laid out that information. Oh. When we wrote the Pew Grant, 
you have to write, you know, your bibliography and other projects that you know of that have worked. So you were listed in all of our oh, wow. CDs. People did it and it worked really well. So um, thanks yeah. for doing that. I mean, I feel like you're giving us way too much credit. This is no, no, it was a real inspiration. It really, I mean, the, I don't think it's happening it's here in the same way. I mean, like, you know, Claire to me and mm. all that kind of work thinking about people and bringing in audiences to make and in, in different ways. I mean, it happens here a little bit, but not as much as I would like. But well, like, that's think, what we're trying to change. Yeah. And I think it's, it's just the sort of different ways that it's sort of coming up. Like I think in the UK, all of that engagement stuff seems to have started with individual artists who've looked at the world as a burning burning dumpster fire and tried to like create opportunities and work that makes it slightly better. And clay seems to have been something that people have latched onto in that way. So there's been a lot of spaces that have kind of built up out of, yeah, artistic practice. Whereas here it it seems to be that you're I mean I, I kind of feel like because you don't have state-funded education you have to have more philanthropy like you, if you want something done you've got to do it yourself right and you have that means creating a community and sharing and collectively sharing um spaces and buildings and, and equipment and things like that so you're all of that activity that, you know, maybe looks a bit more kind of shiny in the UK is actually happening here. It's just under the guise of like behind closed doors. Yeah, or maybe instead of like an artist doing it as, as something that seems experimental, it's just that we've been doing it yeah. since 1974 in exactly. this institution. That's a good, that's a good way to think about it. Well, we like you and you like us, <laughs> that's what matters. Exactly. Um, speaking of that, so we have three more minutes. Do you want to tell us your impressions of Philadelphia it's awesome please have me back <laughs> <laughs> excellent yeah it's just really great I like I met Helen the other day thank you so much for having me around your house um and yeah staying with another Helen like it's just been amazing like it just feels like there's such an incredible community and I haven't even really had a chance to walk around the city but it it looks really good I'm excited it looks good yeah and you'll have to come back yeah does anyone have any questions? I do. Yeah. If I can formulate it. Um, so I teach at a state supported university. There is something coming, but it's not for me, for sure. Um, but I'm curious because I feel like a lot of what you describe in terms of what is created when people come together to mm -hmm. work and play for sure happens in a university setting yeah. as well. And like I think about, I, I never could have hacked it at a huge state school like the one that I teach at. I went to a tiny school, but I feel like we provide this little oasis of, again, yeah. the things that you described of like a place where you know you can go and you yeah. see your friends and you, you know where things are. And you, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really like the students, it's their little home, it's the clay studio, it's where, you know, the clay studio at to you older. Um, <clears throat> But I'm curious if you have thought about the difference between kind of what happens in a, in like a more formal academic setting versus in a community setting, community based. Yes. Did, yeah. Did people hear that? The question was ended up with the difference, perceived difference between a university clay studio setting and a community based clay studio setting. So yes, I have. And I think the biggest thing is this idea of marking. And I think what happens in community spaces, you can strive for a standard for sure, but certainly again in the UK, kids and at university level, but certainly kids are being examined and constantly judged through these like increasingly formalized products of quality which don't really mean anything um so there's this sort of and because formal education especially in the UK has to be standardized to a state curriculum it means that that freedom of expression isn't there 
a lot of the time and it's a, it's because you have to be able to kind of fit it into a box so that you can so that the school can t and the teacher can tick a box and you can say okay well they've done this which means that actually a lot of the work that is you know ticks all the boxes ends up being very safe and you don't have that ability to kind of yeah maybe sometimes make mistakes but you don't have that kind of fluidity to be able to just sort of or expansiveness to be able to just make whatever it is you want so you kind of lose a, a certain level of creativity i think um so i think for me that i think that's that's probably the biggest thing um i haven't i mean i don't know in terms of sort of that's certainly one of the biggest issues i think when people are sort of first coming to clay so certainly with kids and sort of you know maybe even adults who are kind of coming to it to it later but having that kind of yeah having to fit into that box i think can can be quite restrictive if you're talking about kind of university level i don't know i mean i think that's one of the things that maybe i'm i'm sort of still rumbling with or trying to like pay attention to in spaces like this it's like how because one of the things that i think is lost in the uk from the sort of decline in hg is oh, comment on that uh, sorry, higher education. Ah, got it. Sorry, higher okay. education. Um, is the, you know, again, there's so many problems with the education system, but what the universities did provide was a kind of intellectual hub and a space for like-minded, high-level thinkers and makers to come together and network across the different universities and have these conversations sort of in depth and whatever. So you've got when it was working at its best and it's obviously extremely white racist white supremacy you know all of these other things like it's very elitist who ends up getting into those spaces but what you did get was this sort of pool of high level thinkers and whatever so things kind of progressed i don't know whether that's a good thing or not i don't know but that's what was sort of that's what universities in theory create so if you don't have those hubs for people to kind of come who have already reached a certain standard to then come together and pool their knowledge and then kind of push things forward, maybe that's a loss. But I do think, but I mean, I think you guys are obviously doing it really well already because you're having, you know, amazing international artists coming and exhibiting and you know you've got your talk program and all of these things so like that kind of like level of critical thinking and kind of networking is happening um ask me at the end of my trip and i'll tell you if other places are doing the same thing well what we talked about the other day a little bit was that in the uk there are these kinds of organizations are growing and then they're just they're deciding that to survive they need to get accredited and so they're trying to and they are then there is a system there for creating sort of a certificate or an accreditation yeah. system but then they're sort of um you know losing the benefit of being this more free space yeah the difference between higher ed and and a place like the clay studio because they're now trying to jam themselves into the assessment model that is necessary yeah. which you know in when I have worked in the university setting and seen the incredible work and machination that has to go into um, the obtaining mm -hmm. these certifications, and it just it you know the ta the tail ends up wagging the dog. Yeah, definitely, and I think I don't. I personally don't think that universities are really the answer. I mean, in the UK, art used to be completely separate anyway. It used to used to have independent art schools um, where people would go and they just. I mean, again, they used to be finishing schools, so I'm not like kind of saying that they were like these amazing things. But you know, they started off, and there was a kind of a heyday where they were actually these really quite kind of radical, interesting, kind of exciting spaces. Again, with the caveat that it was all mostly white men doing that but there was like some good innovation that was happening there and they were kind of creative hubs um and yeah the way that universities are going is again in the uk is that it's becoming so formalized and so kind of packaged and standardized really that like art doesn't quite fit into those packages and i think that i wonder if like 
what's happened to ceramics in HE and higher education in the UK is kind of the preemptor of what's going to happen to the rest of the creative arts that basically they're going to eventually be seen as too expensive and not making enough money to fit within the academic model of universities as they stand at the moment which is why I think spaces like this and the PhD are like is what I'm kind of why I think it's so important to kind of nurture these new spaces because you know you have an opportunity here to create new models of education and kind of pedagogy and community and use of art which is flexible it's within it's built for and by a community like it can move it can flex it can do all of these things it can be accessible in a way that formal education it just isn't so yeah I'm I'm quite hopeful and kind of excited and I do think that yeah like coming to places like the clay studio who are doing like we were talking about this earlier um this who are creating a building and an institution where you have the full arc where you start at kids and then you end up with kind of professional artists and all of that is housed within one building it's kind of amazing I think that's a really exciting place to be well exciting places and um saying nice things about the play studio sounds like a good place to stop <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Eva thank you Always lovely to talk to you yeah. thank you for your inspirational work